You are listening to the Art of Sales. Everyone sells every day, and this is your source for conversational, real-world sales and prospecting methods that you are comfortable using and that get results. You'll help people buy instead of pushing them into being sold. Here's your host, Art Subcheck. So I've long been fascinated by trial attorneys and how they use salesmanship in so many areas, even though they don't necessarily call it that. And in fact, over the years, I've studied books on legal cross-examination and other techniques used by attorneys to try cases and have adapted a lot of those for sales situations. Now, today, we have with us a very accomplished and experienced trial attorney and also a judge to share with us some of the ways lawyers use salesmanship that we can model as well. Jess LaRona is a partner at LaRona Mead in Phoenix and has been practicing law for over 32 years. He's also a judge pro tem for the city of Phoenix Municipal Court and several other county and Indian tribal court systems. He's a faculty member of the Arizona College of Trial Advocacy and is a frequent lecturer in Arizona and other states on the topics of ethics, professionalism, and trial advocacy. Jess also appeared in ABC's five-part documentary series on the legal system, which was called State V. Jess, welcome. How you doing, Art? I am doing great. It's such a pleasure to have you on here. I, Like I mentioned, I've, I've long been a fan of uh, trial attorneys and, and, of course, I've watched a lot of the uh, legal TV shows over the years. So pretty much what you do is just like Boston Legal, right? Correct. No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no, so you're, you, you wouldn't be Denny Crane? No, I would not be Denny Crane. All right. Well, let's talk about what, what you are, and I know you've got a lot to share with us today. And I always start out by asking our guests how they got into sales, so I'll ask you a variation of that. So, so what jobs or positions or experiences did you have when you were younger that shaped your ability and desire to influence people? Sure. So my very first job was as a newspaper boy. Um, I would deliver the Arizona Republic. I had a little Schwinn bike, and I did it when I was 10 years old. Um, so obviously, with respect to that position, I mean, you know, the paper usually would um, provide me with information as to who, who wanted the paper, and then I would have to make contact with them and sign them up and ultimately collect from them. And so I would have a lot of contact with customers. Um, my second job was when I moved, my mom remarried and we moved to Eloy, Arizona, uh, the fabulous metropolis of Eloy. And my stepfather owned a Circle K and I worked in the Circle K. Um, back then, in the older days, you could not sell alcohol on Sundays until 12 o'clock. And so I was able to open the Circle K by myself on Sundays. So I worked a lot in the Circle K and I dealt with a lot of customers. And then ultimately my dad purchased a variety store where, where we were completely involved in sales. And so we would be selling a, a lot of clothes and toys and other, that's why it was called the variety store, a variety of items. So I had to utilize my salesmanship there. So with, with that experience, how did you decide you wanted to get into law? You know, I decided after I graduated from high school that I wanted to major in criminal justice. At that time, I wanted to be a police officer and or an FBI agent. Um, so I knew I wanted to be in law enforcement. And it was while I was attending school um, and in that capacity, that I made a decision that my services were um, needed um, as a lawyer as opposed to a law enforcement officer and I decided to go to law school. And how did you pick the the type of law that you're in as far as being a, a litigator? Well, you know, my I, I always wanted to do criminal defense and so I went into the criminal defense area and um, I, have all, I also do accident cases now but I got all of my experience in my trial work in the criminal defense arena. Okay. So th there's so many ways that trial attorneys practice influence and sales. 
and, and I'm going to use those words interchangeably, and we could probably talk for hours, and, and I'll probably want to have you on again. But for now, I, I want to ask about a few general things today, and, and then perhaps on future shows you can come back and we'll drill deeper into specific areas. So. Uh, law students spend several years having high-level legal philosophy pounded into your heads. I know I went to Creighton University. I hung out with some law students, and they were always complaining. <laughs> I mean, hundreds of case studies and issues and theories and, and then actual laws. And then for someone like yourself who goes into the litigation, and maybe I'm oversimplifying this, but, but then you need to essentially make a jury and sometimes just a judge like and believe you and your client better than the other side. Does, does that kind of describe it? That definitely describes it. So uh, then let, let's get into some of the areas where persuasion and influence and negotiation come into play. Uh, sound good? Sounds good. All right. So I, one of my previous episodes, we, we talked about, or actually I talked about how, was, how I was on a jury, which I found fascinating. And most people I know try to get out of jury duty. Um, and that was episode 44, if you guys would want to listen to that. It's where I actually use some sales skills. So, so Jess, tell us what goes into the jury selection process and any sales or influence techniques that are involved, both with the potential jurors and the attorney on the other side. Sure. Um you know, by the time you're you're in trial, you've pretty much exhausted um, all avenues of resolving the case um, by way of plea agreement or, or negotiating out of a trial. So you're actually at that point in the case where you know you definitely you're picking a jury and you're and you're going to trial. You really have have no other option at that point. And and picking a jury, um, you know, some lawyers will say it's it's the art of deselection that you end up with the jury. Um, not of who you really wanted to be on your jury, but by the process of deselection, you have what you have. Um, I, I know that uh, my wife does a lot of my voir dire, um, assists me with my voir dire of juries, but we look for, based upon the type of case, specific type of jurors. One of the things that we want the jury to understand is that we are advocates and we want them to like us, you know, so a lot of what I do during voir dire is to utilize my skills to persuade a jury that I'm a nice guy. You know, I'm a nice guy and not only am I a nice guy, but I can be trusted and, and what I'm going to say to you will always be the truth. And also because I'm a nice guy, therefore you should like my client. I granted my client, you may not on it on its face like him because him or her because of what she or he is charged with but I'm a nice guy and I'm telling you my clients a nice guy and and so you should trust me and so um, that the part of it is is being honest with the jury and and asking them questions in, in an honest and forthright matter and and just being truthful with them let's go back to the, the term voir dire to sure. explain that sure voir dire is is the process of where a what happens is a, a pool of jurors is selected, whether it be the county or the state or the federal, they bring in a pool of jurors um, from the community. The idea is, is a defendant is entitled to a jury of his or her peers. So you bring in a number of people and then you begin the process of questioning the jurors. Um, first of all, they have to qualify jurisdictionally to be there. But then the idea is then you question them about whether they have any previous jury experience, whether they've been on uh, previous trials, what type of trial, and then you look for certain qualities about them. You know, do they know anything about the case? Um, have they been a victim of the type of case? Any any family member been a victim of this type of case? Do they have any preconceived notions um, about this type of case? And so it just goes through the process of questioning them to try to come up with the most fair and impartial jury. So I'm sure everybody is probably asking themselves this right now, and they want me to ask you this. How does somebody get out of jury duty when they're going through this process and you're asking them questions? Well, what's what's really interesting is um, very early on in the jury selection process, one of the very first questions that's asked is, do you have any conflict that would keep you from sitting as a juror in this case, whether it be medical, employment, or otherwise? And you'd be I don't think you'd be surprised, but you have a number of people that raise their hands because they don't want to be there. And so initially um, they will 
talk about or create some conflict with the process, whether it be, a, you know, the trial is going to last four days. I can't be here on Thursday. I have a doctor's appointment or other other reasons or other excuses. Um, those are preliminarily ways people get off. But the most the most um, prevalent response is a juror will say, I cannot be fair and impartial in this case. I've already determined that that person is guilty or responsible and there's no way I want to sit on this trial. And those people immediately are removed because they're saying, hey, right out of the chute, I can't be fair and impartial. So that's the so easiest that way to go. It does, it does, in fact, work because from where I sit, I don't want somebody sitting in my jury that's not going to listen. You know, if, if they've already – they already want off. They want off that badly that they're going to say whatever it is that they need to say to get off. I don't want them there because that means they're not going to listen to my case and they're not going to be there with an open mind. So I want them off. So is it true that – Opposing attorneys will negotiate with each other for jurors. Kind of, I want this person. You can have that person. That that has, you know, occasionally there will be someone that just is so out there that both attorneys agree. Yes, this person should be excused, um, based upon some answer they give, or they may have fallen asleep during the voir dire process or whatever. So both lawyers get together and they say, Yeah, we agree. This person should be removed. Um, but that's, you know, that's few and far between, you know, you'll have some that you'll agree on, but for the most of the part, for most part, you don't agree on, on which jurors should be stricken. Okay. So going back to what you had said earlier, getting someone to like you, which of course, likability is proven to be one of the most important aspects of, of sales. What are some techniques? What, what do you do to get people to like you? Other than, of course, I know you're just a, a likable human being. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, it's eye to eye contact make make maintaining eye contact with jurors a lot of times what you'll see are is jurors turning away or looking away from you and when i see that um, my initial inclination is they don't like me and they don't like my client and they don't like the case um, so i try to generate eye to eye contact with them i try to in based upon the way i handle myself in the courtroom let them know based upon my behavior and the qu questions that i have I ask them that I've been there before. I've obviously been in court before. I've obviously done trials before. And, and therefore, because of my experience, you can rely on my knowledge of the law and what I'm doing and the process that I'm utilizing. So this is when you're already in in the trial. Right. So you, you've got people that might be nodding off. So you want to make sure That's right. that, that they're paying attention. That's right. All right. All right. So, so you mentioned questioning and the questioning is the basis for professional sales. And of course, much of what you do in a trial and before a trial. So share with us several of the ways you use questions, strategies you use, any examples, I mean, anywhere you want to go with this. Sure. You know, when, when we initially, or when, when I initially see a client, I know um, that they're there for answers and so the quality of my answers are very important to any prospective client and that comes from my experience and my knowledge knowledge of the law but beyond that um, it's it's empathy for their situation I think often lawyers can uh, rely on their laurels and their experience and their reputation but not but have no empathy for the person that is sitting across from them and I think that's very very important so that you you empathize with their situation you say that you understand their situation and you sell your services to them you're selling your experience your training and the fact that you're able to say look I understand where you're coming from I understand why you feel the way that you feel and you actually believe in in your abilities as a lawyer. I mean, I, I adamantly believe in, in when I'm telling someone what I what I feel I can do for them. I believe that I'm not going to I'm not going to tell a prospective client something that I don't believe in. Now, as lawyers, ethically, we're not allowed to say you're going to win your case. We're not allowed to say, you know, you, it's an, this is an absolute slam dunk. We're not ethically allowed to do that, but but we can give them some comfort in that we know what we're doing and we sell why it is they should use us. I try to sell why it is someone should use Jess LaRona. 
So you're talking about an initial consultation, yes, somebody needs an attorney, they come in, you're asking questions about the case, and based on their answer, well, of course, you said you're empathizing with them, you're letting them know that you're not this attorney high on the pedestal, you're not the high price attorney that you actually are. But uh, <laughs> I actually read that. I was doing some research on, on your, your appearance on the ABC documentary, and there was a review of it, and somebody had written, Jess Lerona, high-priced defense attorney in Phoenix. I thought that was, that? yeah, I did. That was, that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. You were, you were famous even back then. <laughs> so, all right. So, so that's using questioning, of course, when, when you are selling it yourself, but, but, um, and, and I guess you can call it selling, don't you? And is that Absolutely. still not allowed? Absolutely. Yeah, you can. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Now, now obviously the questioning is, is huge and we could probably just do an, an entire episode on, on using questioning in a trial or cross-examination or all that. But, but, uh, Tell us, let's say you've got, uh, let's say you have a client that maybe the evidence is kind of stacked against them. What, what are some ways you use questioning uh, in either of, of them or of the other side to, to make a point and try to make your case? Well, you know, those are obviously the most difficult cases. You know, um, one of the things of that people need to understand about, understand about criminal defense work is the county attorney or any prosecutorial agency is not going to file charges against someone that they don't believe that they can absolutely um, prove the case against them. So already, you know, they feel very, very strong in their case. Otherwise, they wouldn't have filed their case. So you know initially going in that, you know, you either have to mitigate the damage, in other words, work out a plea, or you're sitting across from someone that you believe is absolutely not guilty. And that, that does happen, Art. I mean, we, we do meet people that are absolutely unequivocally not guilty. Um, but, you know, when it comes to selling a case, you know, the first process is we have to sell it to, you know, the county attorney. Why is this client different than other clients or other defendants that are charged with a like offense? And so it's a matter of presenting a picture to the county attorney that this John Doe based upon his character and reputation is different. He, he's never done this before. This is aberrant behavior. Um, this is not like him. And this is why you should treat him differently and give him a result that's different than maybe other defendants that you see charged with a similar offense. Um, and it also could be a situation where you're in front of a judge and you've already entered into a, a resolution or a plea agreement and you have to convince a judge, judge, this is my client and you know we have a range of a potential resolution but this is why you should give him probation or this is why you should give him lesser prison time because he's different than other people and this is why so you're selling to the you're selling to the judge um, your client and your clients uh, character and reputation so so now we're, we're talking about I guess what in, in legal terms that would be presenting and, and then also arguing right Correct. so I know there's a there's got to be a tremendous amount of, of preparation that that goes into that. T talk a little bit about that because that's certainly one similarity between what you do and what what salespeople should be doing. Right, and you know, and that's like gathering. One of the things that I where I think that lawyers make a mistake is not really getting to know their clients, and that comes from the initial interview that with them and also spending time getting letters of reference or whatever, but figuring out, it's like the product that you sell. It's like getting to know everything that you can, that you can about your client because you're selling your client to the county attorney. You're selling your client to a judge. And so you're garnering all the information that you can. And that may be that you have to go on to Google about them. Maybe that you have to go on to Facebook about them. You want to know every single solitary thing there is to know about your client. And some of what you may find may not be um, beneficial to you. And that's all also good as a lawyer to know. But it's just gathering information. So one, one saying has been around a long time is that you, you should never ask a question that you don't already know the answer to, and it, it especially applies to, to your profession. So, so talk a little bit about that. Oh, that's, that's hilarious because, you know, you mentioned Boston Legal and you watch some programs on TV and I just, we just watched one last night where a question was asked by the lawyer and you had no, no clue what the answer is, you know, and that, that's something that we're, we're taught. You know, you're taught in, in law school and you're also taught after you become a lawyer and it's like, you know, never ask a question you don't know the answer to. And, and that's that's 
the formula that you're supposed to follow. Um, but the fact of the matter is, in any trial, when you're in the in the midst and the throes of litigation, you're going to always ask a question because you have a hunch. You know, you just have a hunch um, what the answer is going to be, and and you just have to ask a question that you don't know the answer to. And sometimes <laughs> it's good, and sometimes it's bad. That, that kind of happened in the OJ trial, right? Absolutely. The, the, the famous example. That's a famous <laughs> example, exactly. Now, now you guys, I, I don't understand the entire process, but but you have the, the deposition process where you get to ask questions in advance, so you already know the answers, and then, then you're actually asking them again in, in a trial. Is that how that That's works? That's correct. Yeah, and I, I always tell salespeople, and I use you guys as an example, I say, we, we don't have the benefit of the deposition, but we can simulate it by thinking of what are the possible questions I'm going to ask, then what are all the possible answers I might get, and then preparing for, for those situations. So what would you consider to be one of your most masterful examples of a sales or influence situation? You know, I, I, I think that it would be the ABC series that, that you may have looked at. Um, that was a very um, difficult case. Um, ABC followed me around for more than a year. I tried that case to a jury two times. Um, both times the jury hung. Um, and both times the jury hung, and I believe the vote both times was six to six. There were 12 jurors there. And I think that, you know, that was what was difficult about that trial was, was being able to convince the, the jury that, yeah, my client was under the influence of alcohol. Um, yeah, he was driving fast. Um, yeah, he may have smoked marijuana. Um, and he ultimately drove into this, you know, area where there were barricades set up and there was a construction dome that was not properly marked. And he did ultimately, um, he was ultimately involved in an accident that killed his cousin. Um, and I had to sell to the jury that, you know, although he did these things and his acts may have been, con been criminal, there was another cause for the incident and it was the construction zone and the construction people that were the ones that were at fault and not my client. And so it, it was selling to the jury that, that someone else was at fault as opposed to my client, that there was another cause there other than my client. And, and both times I was obviously able to convince some of those jurors to side with me in my position, not all of them, but some of them. And they did hang t two times and ultimately we did um, the third after the two trials the county attorney did agree to a resolution that was favorable to my client where he didn't have to go to prison and so um, I think that was my best sales job today. Wow so so when there's a hung jury essentially that means that there, there's no conclusion and you win right well what it means is they could not reach a resolution as to guilt or innocence and so the case has to be tried again and, you know, after the first trial, the county attorney did choose to try the case a second time. And so we did pick a jury and try the case a second time. But after the third trial, they I mean, after the second trial, they decided they didn't want to try it a third time and we reached a resolution. So f as far as I'm concerned, for what I do, I felt it was a win. So you just wore them out. <laughs> <laughs> So one, one, one thing I always tell, again, salespeople is that we're, we're never going to change somebody's mind by talking at them. The only way somebody will change their mind is when they go through a process in their own mind to do so, but we can help them. And, and part of that process involves creating doubt first so that they think to themselves, hmm, maybe that could be true. And of course, that, that's what you guys do in your profession, trying to create some reasonable doubt there. What, what are some techniques or, or tips that, that you use and probably don't even think about that, that maybe everybody could, could use or emulate? For a reasonable doubt? Yeah. Well, yeah, getting somebody to just think a, think a little bit differently. Well, you know, maybe there's another way to look at this. Well, you know, that's just it. It's, it's, it's convincing them or at least getting them to look at it in a different way. You know, I, since I do some pro teming as a judge and since I've been doing this for in excess of 30 years, you know, I know what the burden of proof is um, for the state. I know what, they, what it is they're required to do. And, and what I have to do is try to convince a juror, look, you know, 
they have not met their burden of proof. They're obligated to do this under the law. They have the primary responsibility under the law. And if they can't meet this burden, you have to find them not guilty. And it, it's hard to get jurors to cross that, to, to you know go over that hump to get them to find reasonable doubt. But in a lot of cases, that's all we have. And so it's a matter of, once again, utilizing your experience and training and getting them to believe you and trust you. And, and if you're telling them, hey, there's reasonable doubt, then they have to trust you and believe there's reasonable doubt also. So again, it goes back to that first impression, exactly. likability, creating that, in, that, that uh, the, the image in their mind that, yeah, I kind of like this person. Exactly. So uh, we'll kind of wind down here. What, what typical sales or influence mistakes do you see attorneys make? I think that um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to utilize my um, experience as a pro tem and what I see because as a pro tem now, what I see are a lot of lawyers appearing in front of me that are young, Explain younger pro lawyers. A pro tem is a judge that is a, a lawyer that comes in and basically substitute pro tems for a judge on a substitute basis when the judge is on vacation or ill or for a various number of reasons. So the judge who normally sits and hears, um, sits in that court, brings in another attorney or another judge to substitute for him for that day. So then I then become the judge for the day or for the case. Um, kind of like a substitute teacher. So huh? Exactly, like a substitute teacher. And, and what, <laughs> Except you don't get treated like a substitute teacher. I don't, teacher. I don't. But I think a lot of times what, what the mistake that younger lawyers make is that they don't trust the process and they don't trust the judge. In other words, they try to, I, I see lawyers trying to bully judges and try to um, instruct judges on the law. And oftentimes I find myself saying to the lawyers, look, I have been doing this for a very long period of time. I've actually been in your shoes doing exactly what you're doing, and I know the law. You don't have to go down this road with me. Let's move on. You know, and so I, that's what I, what I usually see is that lawyers are trying to um, bully the process, um, not trust the judge, not trust the process, and, um, and go outside that foundation of, hey, just do your case. Just present your case and let me make your decision make my decision sounds like they need to listen to this and especially pay attention to the likability factor oh like with the judge yeah, to me likability is huge i mean you know one of the things that, that i learned at a very young age is all we have is our reputation and if if lawyers don't think that judges talk judges talk and judges talk amongst themselves and so if you go into a courtroom and the judges have talked and the judge you're in front of knows you and respects you that's half the ball game right there you know they know that you're not gonna you're not gonna say something to the court that's not true or there's something that you don't believe in and that you can make a vows to the court because the court trusts you and to me that's huge do they teach you in law school that judges are human too no <laughs> I think they should. They, they don't teach us that, but the fact of the matter is, you know, everyone involved in the process of litigation, everyone is is a human, you know, and and treating everyone with the absolute respect is is so important. I just had a case involving a victim that was an 89 year old woman, and and I made a decision that it was not worth my time to cross-examine her at all I did not want to make her suffer any further pain other than what she had already suffered and I chose not to question her now that was my decision that was Jess Lorona's decision but I felt like for based upon my experience and reputation that's what I needed to do and I did it art and um, anyway so so she was the opposition she and she was the victim of a crime correct okay Okay. All right. Gotcha. Just we could talk for hours, and I do want to have you back on so we can drill deeper into some of these areas and kind of get into the weeds on, on some specifics like questioning and so on. But for now, let's, let's wrap this up. What are some final suggestions that anyone in sales can use that maybe things that you use every day? You know, I think it's, I think it's so important to, um, you know, trust your your experience in your training and um, have knowledge of the area 
and and sell your experience and training and your knowledge of the law and your product, um, but believe in yourself. And I, but I think more important than that is there's a, there's another person on the other end, and it's having empathy for that person. I think sometimes we can get get overburdened by the process of making money or getting that retainer um, from the client they were really not as concerned about hey how are you feeling about this you know and, and, and understanding the client and why it why it is you should trust me and I think that's that's important it's true in law and it's true in sales when we don't make it about us but we make it about them then the rewards will come Jess, thank you so much. And uh, well, hey, one of our regular features is the quote of the day. Your attitude will be I am. Never will, never feel what they say. It's the art of the sales. The quote of the day. I'm ready. So I'm going to quote. I'm going to quote David Brinkley. He says, a successful man is one who can lay a firm foundation with the bricks others have thrown at him. Wow. That, so tell us a little bit about why that's important to you. It, it, it's important to me because I wasn't in the top 10 of my law school class. Um, in fact, I was probably in the last third percent of my law, law school class. And so I, I know and knew ahead of time when I went in to apply for jobs that I would have to sell myself. And there were many times when people wouldn't even talk to me based upon my resume, um, my ranking in law school, but my, my adage was always art. Hey, you let me in the door, you talk to me, you're going to hire me. And I've always believed that. And so I've always believed that it's been more difficult for me in, in what I've done as a lawyer. Um, it's been harder for me because of my, my experience and my background, but I've always believed that you talk to me, you hear the words that come out of my mouth, you're going to want to hire me as a lawyer and you're going and you're, because you will. So the reason you were in the bottom uh, 3%, we won't get into, but uh, I would one, imagine. One third, one third. <laughs> oh, I thought you said 3%. No, not three. Oh, no. 3% is a, a much better story. Yeah. But uh, but I would imagine you're probably in, in the upper third of, of people that were in your class as far as what you've accomplished, which, which again, uh, goes towards the point that we uh, academically, we, we don't need to be the best, but in, in practice and in the human element, when that when that becomes uh, the the major thing that we're focusing on, the, the results are going to come. So, Absolutely. Jess, again, thank you. Thanks, Art. Thank you. Thank you so much. So tell us how people can uh, contact you or sure. any links or anything you'd like to sure. mention. Um, I'm at Jess, Jess at LaRona, L-O-R-O-N-N-O-N-A, Mead, M-E-A-D dot com. Our website is www.LaRonaMead.com. And my direct line is 602-385-6818. Fantastic. Hope, hopefully nobody will, will need you out there, but if they do, you're, you're the kind of contact. Thank you. Uh, all right, everybody. So thank you so much for investing your valuable time with us. And I do have a request for you. If you're getting value from this show, would you please tell a couple other people who could benefit as well? Send them to our show site theartofsales.com theartofsales.com and if you would like hundreds of other sales tips audio video text go to my blog which is smartcalling.com smartcalling.com until next time go out and make it your best sales day ever